Hi, grab pizza while you can, because Jill's going to be closing shop here in a second. So uh, it's a great pleasure of mine to introduce today's Cancer Center seminar speaker, Dr. Tom Akadoki. He is uh, uh, in uh, the School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences across the street over there. Uh, he got a bachelor's originally from Oregon State and then actually taught middle school math, which I think uh, pummeled him back into academia. So from there he went to uh, University of California, Davis, got a master's and a PhD there, and pretty much ever since then has been either in Boulder or on this campus when this campus was out there in the downtown, uh, and has risen through the ranks of, of a postdoc and all the, way, all the way up to a full professor with tenure in the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences. So Tom has, um, I think, like 13 patents, uh, a whole bunch of papers, a whole bunch of grants, all that sort of stuff, and uh, he's also received awards as a reviewer. And when you think about that, we universally hate reviewers. So if you're able to get an award on that, you must be doing something special. And he's also uh, he's received teaching awards as well. And I think you'll see that in the way he presents this talk today, even though he's told me it's confusing and he has no idea what's going on. Uh, but the one thing that I think of when I think of Tom is this magnificent collaborator. Um, I've worked with him pretty much since I set foot on campus. And he is a marvelous collaborator, and everybody wants a piece of him. And it usually works out. We've, we've had a very good relationship and have had lots of success together. But the one thing he said one time, and this is very profound, and I want you to take it to heart. He said, life is too short to collaborate with assholes. So with that, well, I'll introduce Tom's talk, Milk Magic and the Role of Leukocytes in Drug Delivery. Uh, thank you, Grainer. Um, it's nice to be quoted, uh, I guess. Um, so um, I'm going to give you a different talk today. I'm going to give you two little talks, uh, like two 20-minute talks. And they're on two totally different topics, one of which uh, the first one, I hope you find both of them interesting, but I think you'll find the first one especially interesting. Uh, the first one, I think our group was the first one, first people in the world to understand what's going on. And so that's kind of fascinating and potentially has applications uh, for cancer patients and maybe other patients as well. Um, the second half of the talk, we're probably the last people in the world to know what's going on because we still don't know what's going on. Um, so I'm presenting this out of total naivete, the second half especially, um, and I'm hoping that some of you know more than I do and you can uh, weigh in on on what might be going on here. We have some pretty crude understandings, but I'll show you the data we have, and um, we always have more experiments to do, but I, I would appreciate your input on anything, but I think, in, especially in the second half, I feel like we're really swimming in uncharted waters, at least for us. We're not immunologists, we're not hematologists, so we start talking about leukocytes, and, and we're really out of our league. We have some help, gratefully, um, but uh, we could always use more. So, um, yeah, this is going to be fun. Um, so oral delivery of IV drugs. This is going to be something that I think is really, uh, is truly unbelievable. Um, and and uh, I think we have the data to convince people. Um, but um, the idea here is that we have um, patients, where does this, how does this thing work? Oh, there we go. Uh, we have patients, elderly patients, they need infusions, uh, sometimes antibiotics, sometimes chemotherapeutics, typically six weeks of therapy um, of infusion. If they want to stay at home and do this, Medicare doesn't cover the cost. Medicare only covers the cost of the drug, which is usually a couple hundred dollars. And so unless they have $12,000 sitting around, they opt to go to a hospital. So they end up charging the system $50,000 or so. And they have to travel, and they get exposed to other sick people. So this is not only expensive, but their mortality rate goes way up because they have to travel and be exposed to people. There is an a intermediate option of going to an infusion center, but again, they're exposed to people and have to travel. So for a lot of elderly people, this is problematic. Um, so wouldn't it be nice if we could deliver these things instead of giving them through the vein, if, we could, if they could take it orally, right? And we all know the barriers to delivery uh, orally. We have tight junctions. The intestine have to get through that. Um, there's a little known, um, I shouldn't say it's little known. It's well known. It's not understood. Um, a process of transcytosis, and that is, oh, boy, how's this? Oh, here it is. Okay. So... All right, here's transcytosis. So you can potentially have a cell endocytose something and have it come out the other side. And the process by which this happens, again, isn't very well understood. 
Um, but this would be great if we could uh, take advantage of this and get through the gut and therefore we could deliver things orally that we typically have to deliver IV now. Um, um, and so how does mom do it? We've known for 50 years that a mother passes antibiotics, or sorry, not antibodies, not antibiotics, antibodies through the gut to the baby. So when you think of absorption through the gut, you think of maybe an amino acid, glucose, small little molecules. You don't think of a 150 molecular weight antibody going through the gut, but we know it does, right? We've known this for 50 years. Um, and so how does she do it? How does mom pass antibodies to us? And it's any mammal can do this, right? It's not just uh, humans. Cows can do it. Any mammal can do it. And so that's the question is, can we take advantage of that? Um, and it turns out that there is a receptor that's known specifically to bind to antibodies. There's a little antibody there. And, and it, it gets internalized into the cell. It binds to this receptor. And it either gets recycled or it can actually come through the other side via this process of transcytosis. And the, the binding to this receptor is pH sensitive. So it comes in, it binds uh, at the low pH in the endosome, and again, it either gets recycled or dumped on the other side. And so that's how antibodies get um, from our mother's milk into the baby's uh, blood. Um, and this has been taken advantage of for uh, drug delivery, and you've probably all heard of these efforts at oral insulin. And so what they have is a particle with insulin in it, and they've targeted this FC receptor. This FCRN receptor is just the FC, the R is receptor, and N is for neonatal. And, and the, the, the thought is there that this is for a, a, a baby, but in fact we express this receptor at really high levels all throughout our adult life. So it's potentially useful for um, insulin or other drugs if we can get through. Um, but targeting this isn't so easy. Uh, making a particle with a protein on it that stays native, et cetera, is very expensive. Um, and so this project was ultimately abandoned after probably $100 million or so dollars put into it. Um, it, was, uh, it was abandoned. So this is kind of how you would go about it. There's these weird reports in the literature um, of cow's milk being able to survive the acidic environment of the stomach, right? The, the, these exosomes, these particles that are made by cells and they're spit out into, and Grainer's really the expert on this, but they're spit out into any fluid, blood, serum, uh, you know, urine, uh, milk. Uh, your, your cells are constantly spewing these things out. And so in milk, cow's milk, there are exosomes from a cow and they survive the low pH of the stomach. And this isn't entirely surprising if you think as an evolutionary biologist, that is, if the mother is using these exosomes to pass something to the baby, that they should be designed, they should be made of components, lipids and proteins that are rigorous enough and pH resistant enough to, to survive the stomach. And in fact, that's been reported, again, um, fairly just in the last couple of years, that's been reported. And most people don't believe those reports, but you can kind of see how maybe they survive the acid environment in the stomach. What's less believable is this report. It's a clinical trial from 2014 where they showed that the cow exosomes in milk contain cow or bovine RNAs, microRNAs, as all exosomes do, and that given these, these exosomes from cow's milk to patients, they dump these microRNAs into the blood of the patients, and the blood of the human patients those genes are regulated by the microRNAs of the cow. Right? So you are what you eat. Right? This is uh, kind of maybe scary, but it seems unbelievable. And in fact, people I've talked to experts in the field, they just say, can't happen. Don't believe it. Right? But this was a clinical trial. Um, and there's even been follow-up work more recently where they said, you know, we should really be thinking about this. You know, cows may be passing stuff to us humans, and is that good or bad, especially for babies? Maybe it regulates genes. Maybe that's good. Maybe that's bad. We should figure it out. Again, most people in delivery field, uh, would, maybe most is, is not accurate. All people in the delivery field do not believe this. Um, and so um, I'd seen enough of this data, and here's another paper that came out where they showed they delivered they loaded paclitaxel into these exosomes from a cow, and they gave it to mice orally, and they were able to shrink tumors with it. 
Okay, so I'd seen enough of this paper. This was this came out uh, just late late last year. And I'd seen enough of this data to think, yes, this data is pretty convincing. I mean, maybe I'm a fool for believing it, but but uh, it seemed pretty convincing to me. So uh, I got back and got all excited about this idea that maybe the cow exosome was taking advantage of this pathway that you know mothers pass antibodies to uh, to the to the babies, and. Um, I started reading up about it, and I found that um, if we look at the human receptor for human IgG, you get about a 92 uh, binding ratio or a, a equilibrium constant of about 92. And for cows, it's much less. It's about 30% of that. But think of how much milk people are drinking, certainly kids. That's enough where you could get, potentially get binding and crossing into the, into the blood of a kid. And so I thought, hmm, this is plausible. Um, and so what I was proposing is this, that there's, there's cows, we're drinking cow's milk, but they could be passing things to us as humans, especially as babies. And so I got online, and you can't use uh, pasteurized milk. You can't just go even to Whole Foods and get organic milk, because the homogenization process will beat up these exosomes. So you have to get raw milk, right? And there's a whole, there's people who are really into raw milk, and maybe some of you are. Um, so I got on the Raw Milk Colorado site or whatever, and I found someone, and I called around, and I found someone who would let me have some raw milk. They can't sell it to you. That's illegal, but they'll give it to you. So I got just a, a quart from four different cows, and we did our little exosome prep. And sure enough, um, when we do that, this is what exosomes look like. They're about 100 nanometers, and we got them out of cow's milk. And we got from four different cows, we got pretty consistent size and pretty consistent charge. So very consistent with exosomes. So then we did some experiments where we loaded these exosomes with a red dye, an infrared dye, right? And we fed them via oral gavage to a mouse. And then we uh, took blood samples from the mouse. So if any of the red dye is getting passed into the blood of the mouse, we should see it. So we took samples, and then with every blood um, sample we took, we just dipped a Q-tip in it and smeared it on a, uh, on a membrane. And that's what this is here. This is, these are four different, or five different time points, 30 minutes, one hour, two hours, four hours, six hours. So they're just smears. You can't see them. This is a black and white image. And when you uh, use an uh, infrared image, you can't see it either. This is a control mouse, right? So this is just given PBS. We did, as, a, as, as another control, we used a liposome, about the same size as the exosome. We put red dye in it. And when you use that, you see a little bit gets across at 60 minutes. So we, th that was kind of surprising me that any would get across. But we are seeing a little bit in the blood at 60 minutes. And then it tapers off at by 120 minutes. Um, then we used exosomes from these cows, these exosomes we isolated. And these are three different mice. And the white indicates that it's off the scale. There's so much red dye in the blood, we have to dial down this, the sensitivity on our instrument, uh, on the detector, as low as we can get. And we're still saturating at all these time points. So a lot of this dye, fed orally in an exosome, seems to get into the blood of a mouse. That's quite surprising. Um, if we looked at the tissues, this is what tissues look like. Uh, here we go. This is just background infrared luminescence from, a, from tissues. Here's when we gave the liposome, and here's when we gave exosomes, three different mice. You see this material gets in the blood and gets distributed to all the different organs in a mouse. Right? This is pretty wild, I think. Um, we then did uh, IV injections. So we compared, this is free, I'm having a heck of a time with it. This is free drug we inject IV in a mouse, not drug, sorry, dye, uh, inject in a mouse, four hours, there's no drug, or no, no dye left in the blood. We can't detect it. If we give it as an exosome, after four hours, you see there's a fair bit in the blood. Um, if we give it orally as an exosome, and this is 10 times the dose of the IV, so just to be fair, we're not giving equal doses. Huh? You like that better? Right here, it's going to be some laser. Then I got to do two-handed. Um, so this is 10 times the dose given here. And you can see we probably get about, this would indicate we get about 10% absorption, maybe even somewhat greater than that uh, in the blood. Um, and 
Um, this will become important later. We just put a, a ligand on the uh, exosome. So not only do we load the dye in there, but we also loaded a peptide on there that will target tumors. And all this does is show that uh, this gets in the blood just as well as, as if it didn't have this peptide on it. Okay, so exosomes are being absorbed, and then we look at the tumors. And so here's uh, IV drug, or sorry, IV dye. Um, very little bit gets in the tumors. If we gave uh, dye via the exosomes, IV, it's about the same amount. Now, we give 10 times that orally. We get about the same amount in the tumor. But that exosome that had the ligand that targets the tumors, you see it goes up, what, fivefold or something. So this is really crazy now. Not only are we talking about cow parts or cow particles getting in through a mouse gut, presumably a human gut, and we can carry dye with it, we can also put something on that particle so when it gets across, it actually goes, at least preferentially sticks, where we want it to go, right? So um, if we look at uh, tissue accumulation, if we just have a, an exosome that we fed to a mouse, you see this is the distribution in the different uh, organs. And notice the spleen is very low, right? Just a free uh, exosome. If we, if we use a targeted exosome, the distribution in all of these um, is, uh, is much lower. If we, use, if we look at free dye, the distribution in the spleen is quite low. If we use an IV exosome, so both give an IV, free dye and as, as well as the dye in an exosome, we get a lot in the spleen, right? which is where particles tend to get cleared, liver and spleen. Um, so when we give this oral targeted exosome, we see a lot in the spleen. So and that says that the, this exosome isn't just fusing with the gut, say maybe the, uh, the endothelium there, and dumping the dye. The whole particle gets across, right? The whole particle, we can put something in it, not only a dye, but we can put in a, uh, a ligand, and that whole particle must get across. And it gets cleared in the spleen. If it was free dye, right? It, you wouldn't see much in the spleen, but we see quite a bit in the spleen, consistent with what a whole exosome would do if we injected an IV. So we did this experiment. We put a label on the membrane of the exosome, and we labeled the RNA on the inside of the exosome. So we have two labels, and then we took those exosomes, and we gave oral gavage to a mouse, and then we did an exosome prep from the blood in a mouse, right? And when you see, when you look at that, what you see is a lot of these particles have both dyes in them, right? So that, again, that whole particle, the inside as well as the outside, the shell material, is getting in through the gut. That's pretty surprising when we think of, you know, glucose and small molecules getting across the gut. Here we got a whole particle, 100 nanometers, getting across. Um, so... We came back to this question of, is it going through this receptor, this FC receptor? And in fact, here's exosomes in the blood. I showed you data like this before. If we co-administer with the exosomes some bovine IgG, so if the IgG on the exosomes, we know exosomes bind a lot of IgG. If, that, if the uh, bovine IgG is binding to the receptor, we should be able to outcompete that. Right? And in fact, when we administer co-administer IgG with the exosomes, uh, we see decreased absorption. And if we give more, we see even less. And if, it seems to saturate somewhere between 200 and 2,000. So this is convincing that we're binding to this FC receptor. If we use a different protein, so this was just some protein we had lying around. Um, uh, we borrowed from a neighbor. If we use a different protein, we use whopping amounts of a different protein. This is ethogen. We don't see this effect. So it's, it's not just dousing the gut with protein. We're giving protein, but it's very specific. This competition for the receptor is very specific for uh, bovine IgG. So um, if we look at tissue accumulation, again, here's the different tissues. Um, isolated, they're in a well. That's why it's circular. But here's the tissues. You can see we get a lot of dye in the wells. If we add or co-administer uh, bovine IgG, you see this goes down the more we administer. And if we administer another protein instead of the bovine IgG, then no effect on it. So again, it's very specific for the, uh, 
IgG. So the conclusion of this part is that um, IV infusion of drugs is really expensive. It costs tens of billions of dollars every year. Right? And it also com uh, compromises the health of some patients. So if we could administer these things orally through milk, I mean, this seems like it has a uh, pretty uh, outstanding potential. So um, we think that, as, as I said, we think this is going through this FCRN receptor, um, and this, this is expressed all through life. So that's the first part of my talk, and I'm just going to thank the people who did the work here, uh, as well as Pamela, the one I called on the phone, who was part of this whole Raw Milk Colorado consortium. And she's, uh, she said, wow, that sounds really cool. I'd love to help with cancer research. How much milk do you want? You know? So um, anyway, she's been very, she and her husband, Jeff, have been giving me milk, and we've been isolating particles out of it. All right, so that's the first part. That's pretty amazing. And like I said, I didn't believe it. But there was enough publications that were convincing enough that I thought we'd try it. And I thought, of course, it would fail. And it worked spectacularly. So we submitted a grant. We actually got a decent score on it. So we'll see what happens with that. All right, so now we're going to completely switch topics. This is the part I don't understand. Um, we've been working on delivering genes to tumors for almost 20 years in my lab. Um, and the experiments I'm going to talk to you about today, and it's important to understand the difference between the experiments, is one thing we do is we administer, so we have a particle made of lipid, and we bind a, a plasmid DNA, and we administer this, this is now IV, um, to a mouse, and then we can pull out tissues or blood samples at different times, and we can use PCR and quantify pretty precisely how much plasmid is in those tissues or in the blood. Okay? Um, so that's one type of experiment. Now, the other type of experiment is We've worked with Karen Helm and others at the flow, cyt uh, flow cytometry facility and looked at uptake into, um, into specific leukocytes. And that's a different experiment in that we're, we're fluorescently labeling these particles and then we're pulling blood samples at different times doing flow cytometry and, and, and quantifying how much is in different leukocytes. So um, this is a system, like I say, we've been working on for a long time and we thought we were making progress, but uh, we've learned something pretty useful, I think, Recently, So here's where we are, right? Uh, where we were. We express this, as many people do, per gram of tumor. And this is kind of hard to understand, but we'll get to that a little bit more later. But if you look in the tumor at a certain time, uh, you know, you have so much in the tumor. And then if you look at a later time, there's less in the tumor. So some of that material that's getting the tumor is being cleared over time. Um, but if you, if you do some math, um, you actually figure out that there's quite a few plasmids actually getting to each cell, we don't know if they're getting to cell, but each cell, but on average, we have, even after 24 hours, we have 16 plasmids getting to the tumor for every tumor cell that are in that tumor. So we thought we were doing pretty well. Okay? We've uh, modified our formulation so that we got, uh, this is a tumor uh, in the shoulder of the mouse, and you can see it's expressing, in this case, this is luciferase. We can see that expression is primarily in the tumor, it is a little misleading because the depth on these, these IVIS images are, are uh, the obscure uh, expression that's below the surface uh, for the most part. But you do see uh, different formulations, see expression in different places. So we have a formulation now that seems to express pretty specifically in the tumor. And so we were thought we were doing pretty well here. Um, we get a fair bit of the tumor. Like I said, 16 plasmids or so per tumor cell. Um, and it's expressed largely in the tumor. What we've known for a long time, and people don't typically think about this in my field, but if you actually add up all the plasmid you find in the different tissues, um, we've always done our experiments, as most people in the field do, after 24 hours. And after 24 hours, if you add up all the plasmid that you injected, uh, you add up all that's in the tissues, it's not near what you injected. It's about 5% of what you injected. And so we're missing 95% of it or more. You know, there's some error here, 90, 95% of it. And we thought, well, this isn't a concern because after 24 hours, this plasmid gets in. If it doesn't get inside a cell, it's probably degraded by the cells. And so we've lost it. Um, and we were content with that explanation, as the field generally is. Um, people don't do these types of experiments. Then we did this annoying experiment. We looked at five minutes. And what we saw was... In five minutes after injection, it really wasn't all that different than after 24 hours. And so we're injecting a mass of plasmid, and 90% of it's gone. We couldn't figure out where it was. 
It's, we look in the blood, we looked in the skin, we looked in the brain and the muscle, all the places that you might see, and we picked up another couple percent or so, but we're still missing a whopping amount of what we're injecting. And we couldn't figure it out. And, and in talking with Jamie, uh, the person I work with, she, we said, you know, where could it possibly be? And it occurred to us that when we measure the blood, the first thing we and everyone else in this field does is you take a blood sample, you've got a kit, you spin out the cells, and you measure the plasma. This is typical. We never measured the cells. Right? Is it possible it could be in the cells? And so when we did that experiment, we looked in the cell fraction, we found 90% of them. All this plasma we're ejecting is just sitting in the cell fraction. And we and nobody else had thought to look there. Um, and we could change the formulation, we could change the charge on it, we could change the lipids in it, and it didn't seem to make that much difference. We did vary it a little bit, but for the most part, the majority of our plasma, our injected dose, is ending up in the cells of the blood. Not good, right? We're trying to get to the tumor. And so when I talked to some people in the field about this, they said, well, you know, Tom, don't be an idiot, right? You've got a particle that's designed to bind to cells and dump a gene into it. So, you know, when you inject in the blood, it's going to run into a blood cell, and it's going to do the same thing. So we thought, oh, okay, maybe this isn't all that surprising, that it would just be bumping into cells and fusing and, and, and trying to transfect, essentially, this cell fraction. And so we did some experiments, and we looked at flow. And what we saw was that the red blood cells hardly had any of this material in it. It was only the white blood cells. And we had, you know, 80% or so of the material, or sorry, 80% of the white blood cells, the leukocytes in the mouse, were labeled with our material. So we're labeling leukocytes. Um, if we looked at the, uh, how much labeling we saw on the leukocytes, it was pretty high. The leukocytes weren't just bumping into a particle. They were actively taking up a lot of particles. The red cells that were labeled, very few of them were labeled, but they were barely labeled at all. So maybe they just got one stuck to them. But these leukocytes were actively taking up our particles. And again, you know, I don't think about these things like some of you do, but I thought, you know, in retrospect, that makes perfect sense, right? We're using nanoparticles like many people are. You've got a whole immune system designed to scavenge little bacteria or viruses that get in your blood. They don't know that this is a nanoparticle, right? They think it's a virus or some invading species, and so they gobble it up. Okay. Um, hadn't thought about that. The whole nano field doesn't talk about this. Um, if we looked at specific blood cells, you can see that certain cells were almost, almost all of those cells were labeled uh, with our particles. So again, we're labeling uh, different uh, leukocytes. And if we look at one hour, you can see a lot of the circulating myeloid cells and NK cells um, at one hour are labeled. So they've taken up our particles. If we look at 24 hours and we look in the blood, we've lost a lot of those cells. So the thinking is, where did they go? Right? This is a... a this is a fluorescent label, and so, and we know it's stable, or we're pretty sure it's stable. So these cells are leaving the blood, or we think they're leaving the blood, and going somewhere. Where are they going? Um, we would hope maybe they'd go to the tumor, um, but you see, the amount that goes to the tumor doesn't go up from one to 24 hours, it goes down. If leukocytes were migrating to the tumor, we expect it would go up. Um, the other a uh, disappointing thing about this, but I think it's true for anybody who's willing to be honest with their audience. These nanoparticles, very little bit of the injected dose actually gets to the tumor. You usually put it per gram of tumor, and it's a small tumor, so you multiply that out, and you look, your numbers look okay. But when you actually look for a small tumor, you look at how much gets there, it's pretty small. In our case, it's less than a tenth of a percent is actually getting into the tumor. Um, but again, these leukocytes seem to be taking up our particles, but they're not going to the tumor. Um, and if we look at uh, organs, too, at one hour, this is the black bars, and at 24 hours, all these are going down. So these leukocytes aren't necessarily migrating um, to the tissues either. All right? So, um, yeah, you can see, the other, so where are the leukocytes going? It's possible in this case, it was, now we're not talking about a fluorescent dye, we're talking about a plasma DNA, we're measuring with this PCR. It's possible that that plasmid is being degraded, right? Leukocytes take this up, chew up the plasmid, and then when we do our PCR, we can't detect it. So that's the other thing. It's not necessarily... The leukocytes could be disappearing, or they could just be chewing up our particles. 
Um, and so they might be migrating to tissues, but chewing up our particles, and so we can't see the, the DNA. So there's two possibilities there. Um, but the other thing here is that after 24 hours, so this is percent injected dose, there's none in the blood at 24 hours. If you add up these all three percentages, you get about 10% of the injected doses in the tissues. So 90% got picked up by leukocytes. 10% um, in the tissues. I guess that may be where it is. But the leukocytes disappear. We can't figure that out. Um, so we thought, well, these immune cells, these leukocytes, are, uh, are much less numerous in a skid mouse model. So this is a skid mouse that has about 10% of normal leukocytes. So we thought, well, this would be a good test. If the leukocytes are preventing uh, things from getting to the tumor, our particles from getting to the tumor, then we can use a skid mouse and we should get more to the tumor. And in fact, when you do that, you see instead of a tenth of a percent, we get about 1% of the tumor, so quite a bit more. And it goes up at 24 hours. So now the leukocytes that are gobbling up our particles, we verified that, they gobble up our particles too. Those leukocytes, in this case, in the skid mouse, seem to be either not degrading the material or they're migrating to, to organs where we didn't see that before. So, um, but the effect on delivery to the tumor is amazing, right? Uh, you know, 50 to 150 fold more in the tumor. Um, so if we can keep it out of the leukocytes, the skid mice uh, model, if, if we're treating skid mice, this, this might be good. Right? Um, if we look at the, at the organs, Here's the liver. Um, we see a little bit of decrease, maybe, but probably not. That's not real, given those error bars. But if you look at the other organs, most of what's there at, 20, at one hour is still there at 24 hours. So the material that gets there um, to the organs isn't being degraded. So it's very different than what we saw before. And it shouldn't be surprising. A skid mouse has a compromised immune system. It's, got a, uh, it's deficient in complement. Um, and so it's got fewer leukocytes as well. So we see more in the tissue, more in the tumor. Right? But it also seems that once it gets to the tissues, it can't be degraded. So, well, in clinical formulations and the stuff that's in clinical trials, almost all particles are pegylated. Right? And here's a, a liposome, and they put these polymers on it. And this is kind of the idea. What it really looks like is shown over here. This is doxel, a cartoon of doxel, which is a... a, a product in the clinic, but this, the, the polymer doesn't stick long like this. It doesn't stick out that far. It's more concentrated on the surface. It just forms a little surface coating, right? And the idea that the surface coating prevents obstinization, which prevents clearance, and so just as we talked about, if we can prevent leukocyte uptake, more of this gets to the tumor when we pegylate particles. Um, and so we looked at leukocyte uptake, and instead of you know, 90 or 80% getting taken up in a leukocyte, it's about 30%. So the pegylation seems to reduce that. Um, and when we looked at uh, different uh, specific leukocytes, uh, it seems to go down at 24 hours. Um, there's some pretty good error here. Um, but um, we see a similar type of pattern. We see these leukocytes at one hour have a lot of this material, and then at 24 hours, when we look at the leukocytes in the blood, there's much less. So the leukocytes, again, seem to be leaving the blood um, or potentially degrading the material. But this actually it couldn't be degrading the material. I apologize, because this is a fluorescent label. So the, these leukocytes are going somewhere. They're taking this material and going somewhere with it. Um, do they go to the tumor? Um, it looks, this looks a lot like what we saw with skid mice, right? About 1% gets in after an hour. And then even better than what we saw was, well, skid mice was about 3%. This pegylation is about 25 or so. So it's kind of what's happening with skid mice. And we, with the conclusion we reached with skid mice was that somehow the skid mice were incapable of clearing and getting rid of this material. Pegylation seems to have a similar effect on, on both the tumor as well as the organ. Right? So here's the organs. But instead of going down, and this one goes down a little bit, you see accumulation in the liver with time. Okay? In fact, you know, if you look at percent of injected dose, virtually all the dose is in the liver, which isn't surprising. Or it shouldn't be for a nanoparticle. But again, here's the question. We have leukocytes taking up material, and it seems like they're moving to the tissues, which maybe isn't surprising to you. 
Um, but they are moving in that they're not degrading the material and that we can find 100% of what we injected, maybe a little bit more than that due to error, um, after 24 hours. So the material is surviving in the system because of this pegylated coat. Now, something that is highly controversial and not well advertised, but it should be, is that polyethylene glycol, even though it's used in all kinds of uh, therapies, uh, regulated proteins mostly, um, we have in our environment peg everywhere. You don't realize it, but every time you use a lotion or a makeup or a, a laxative or even lots of food, it has polyethylene glycol in it. And so after we've been dosing ourselves long enough, it's not surprising that a fair bit of us um, have anti-polyethylene glycol antibodies, so anti-PEG antibodies in your blood already. Uh, so before you even get therapy, you have anti-PEG uh, antibodies. So this study in 2007 showed that 25% of people have anti-PEG antibodies. So now when you administer a pegylated therapy, in this case pegylated asparaginase, the antibodies react with the, the therapy and clear it. And so it compromises therapy. And that was the point in this 2007 article was that Wow, a lot of patients have pre-existing antibodies and that compromises therapy. Now in 2016, some of you may have saw this talk because uh, Bruce Solinger came here and gave a talk a couple years ago um, about this clinical trial. But this paper came out in 2016 and they found that 36% of patients have anti-PEG antibodies, again, before any therapy. After therapy, the other half of those people have anti-PEG antibodies as well. Um, but the people with the highest levels of anti-PEG antibodies went into anaphylactic shock, right? And, and what Bruce told me when I talked to him was that two people died in this trial, right? So really, you have antibodies to PEG and you're administering a pegylated therapeutic. If your antibodies are high enough beforehand, you can go in a shock. And, and indeed, it did kill a couple people in this trial. Certainly, it terminated the trial at the very least. Um, the paper that you, if you look this paper up, it doesn't mention that people died, but Bruce told me that. Um, and then this very recent paper came out showing that physicians, for the most part, are not aware of this. Uh, they're not aware of anti-PEG antibodies, and those who are aware don't recognize that they can cross-react. So if you have one peg pegylated therapeutic, say a pegylated protein, and then you give doxyl, which is a pegylated liposome, the antibodies will cross-react. And so not only do you have pre-existing antibodies, you now have multiple therapies. You think, well, I'm giving them a different drug. But if they both have PEG on them, the antibodies react to both of those therapies. And that's something we have to be aware of. And in this studies, they found that 70% of patients had pre-existing anti-PEG antibodies. So this is a real concern. So what we're doing in my lab, as it relates to the leukocyte uptake, is we're looking for alternatives to the pegylation. This pegylation worked very well at preventing, preventing leukocyte uptake and getting more material to the tumor. Here we just show that without any kind of coding, this is data I've showed you before, about 80% or so of the leukocytes are positive. Um, if we uh, use PEG, it's reduced quite dramatically and we can use lactose. So lactose is on the cover or on the uh, membrane of all your neutrophils that are floating around in your blood. And so we thought we could take this, this lactose ceramide as a molecule that's in neutrophils. And so we just made, made our, made it, um, made our liposomes with it. And so now we have a lactose coating on here. Um, and it reduces the leukocyte uptake. And you can see this is how much gets to the tumor. Um, I showed you this data for PEG. Lactose doesn't do quite as well after one injection, but uh, it, it's pretty close, right? So now potentially we have an alternative for PEG just by copying what nature already does. Um, if we look at tissue accumulation, this is comparing PEG to lactose, you see very similar profiles, right? Most of this material is in the liver. Um, um, but the, the beauty of lactose is presumably we don't have pre-existing antibodies to lactose. If we did, you know, every cell in our, our all our neutrophils would be, we'd be reacting with them. If we look at cytokine levels, um, you see PEG induces some of these cytokines upon repeat injection. Lactose doesn't seem to do that. That's not entirely true. We find some some cytokines that, that lactose does uh, elicit. But for the most part, PEG is much more immunogenic, even in mice, than is our lactose formulation. So we're still looking for a better formulation. But that's the idea here. So the conclusions from the second part is that leukocytes are involved in clearance of nanoparticles. In retrospect, this seems stupidly obvious. But I can tell you for the nanoparticle field, nobody 
either nobody knows it or they're not talking about it. Um, it cloaking, whether it's with PEG or lactose, whatever, seems to slow this, um, this degradation of the material, the material in this case being a plasmid. And it seems to change the way leukocytes operate. Um, the um, immune response to PEG is a problem. We're trying to find alternatives to that. Um, the other aspect of this is that you can think of this, and people often do in the nano field, they try to turn a negative into a positive. So the fact that you've got everything being taken up by the leukocytes is crappy if you're trying to deliver to the tumor. But if you're trying to deliver to leukocytes because somebody has leukemia, or perhaps they're infected, and so the infected cells are the leukocytes that are floating around, you potentially have a therapy that gets to the right spot. So that's, that's uh, one, uh, one avenue we're taking with Maria Nagel. Maria's um, over in neurology, and we're working with her on um, chickenpox um, uh, infection, which infects the leukocytes specifically. So again, these are the people who did the work. Uh, I see Karen's here, but the people in Flow have been very helpful in terms of, of uh, helping us uh, quantify this leukocyte uptake. Also, Steve Dow, probably many of you know him. And we've submitted a grant on this. Um, haven't had a whole lot of luck, but that's what we're trying to do. So that's the idea, and I welcome people to explain this whole leukocyte degradation thing to me because I don't quite understand what's going on. But I do know in our normal uncoated material, it's taken up by leukocytes, and then we can't find the plasmid anywhere. And then when we coat it or we use a skid mouse, we can find virtually all the injected drug 24 hours later, all the injected plasmid. So, and I don't know why that is, but that's what we're trying to tease apart. So I will stop and take questions. Thanks. Steve Nordine. That's a great question. Why don't we have an immune response to drinking milk? I mean, it, why don't we? I mean, we've been drinking it for, I don't know how long have been, humans have been drinking milk, thousands of years. But we don't. I imagine, well, some people have lactose intolerance, but that's different than an immune response. I don't know if there's ever been a recorded incidence of that, but maybe we just drink it so much as babies that we're tolerant. I, it's a good question. That was a question that... Um, I think we haven't got the summary statements yet, but I think that'll come up, is why, why aren't you seeing an immune response? And it's, it's a good question, but presumably humans have adapted to drink cow's milk for a long time. So, good point. And I don't know. <laughs> Grainer, do you know? I only really know we're one of the few species that actually continue to drink milk after a week, because... <laughs> Suggest that maybe we've selected our sons over time, you know, and, and you know, we're not to, to tolerate this. But it's, it, it's interesting. Uh, and who knows, maybe the, uh, the coating of our, of our gut by exosomes and milk is actually somehow protecting these respects. But yeah, once again, people do have uh, various issues with various kinds of milk sometimes. So. But I don't know. I should also point out that uh, when, when Tom first dredged up this idea, maybe that could bring to do most of the stuff, and I helped with some of the thought process, and we were going, wow, ah, there's no way, this is no way. <laughs> but it works like gangbusters. Yeah? Is there any technical or difficulty to make them conjugate, conjugate it in a PC and the blood conjugate more than a blood conjugate in the conjugate? Technical difficulty. So conjugating a, like a peg to something? I mean, we don't do that part. You can buy it already conjugated. Um, I think, you know, one of the popularities of PEG, one, it works pretty well, but they've made the chemistry so easy. So even if you're not a chemist, you can buy these bifunctionalized PEG, and they'll react with an amine on one side and a sulfur on the other side. And so you can bind it to virtually any particle, and you can bind it to a, a peptide or a protein on the other side to have a ligand. So I think... The other reason people use this is just because it's really easy to use. So I, I can't answer your question other than the reagents are out there. And I've had people, my former postdoc did this kind of thing, and it, he's not a chemist either. So I don't think it's that difficult. Um, but it's not as better and you know, to make the, you know, the type of the nanopathicals using PZ, black lipid, or you whole know, organ. So uh, the question is, which one is better, the glycolipid or PEG? So in the... If you look back, and you have to be an old guy like me to know this, but if you look back into the like 80s, early 90s, 
the original, you know, it was, it was learned early on that with liposomes, if you inject them into an animal, um, that they are cleared very rapidly. They didn't know necessarily about leukocyte uptake, but they just saw that they weren't in the blood a period of time. Presumably they were measuring the plasma. Um, and so what they, they, they got this idea too, and they used glycolipids, GM1 specifically the one, and they saw that that allowed the material to circulate for a long period of time. So the idea of using glycolipids was, isn't new. In fact, it's so old, most people forgot about it. Um, the problem was right about that time, somebody tried PEG, and PEG was cheaper, and they thought, well, this is something we can control, we can commercialize, we don't have to worry about it binding to a receptor because PEG is, you know, obviously not present in, you know, at least it wasn't in those days in our diet and things. So, um, you know, they, they went, to, anyway, the whole field shifted to PEG, and people have been using PEG for, you know, 35 years now. And I think one of the reasons they haven't noticed this leukocyte uptake is because everybody but us puts PEG on their particles, and so they don't, they don't look for it because they, they see most of it in the blood. Um, but still, the, in our hands, a, a fair fraction of it is still cleared in the leukocytes, you know, 30%. But again, most people don't do these kind of quantitative studies. They just look in the tumor and they say, this is how much got there, and then they change the formulation and they see if it goes up or down. They're not really thinking about how much they injected. So I hope that's answering your question. But I think the glycolipid idea is old, so we can't patent it. Um, but I think, you know, I'm less concerned about patent at this age in my life. I just would try to like to get a therapy that we could substitute for PEG because I think as people become aware of these anti-PEG antibodies, and like I said, that trial, two people died. Um, you know, I think the awareness of PEG and its immune reactions to it are going to be, uh, people are going to get more aware of this, which is going to be good for patients, but it's going to limit the number of therapies that we can use on these patients. Yeah, Bob. Wow. Latex beads? They give that to, in the clinic? Do they do it? I, I, perhaps they do. I, I don't know that. But they, so they would load the drug in the latex bead? So they'd use it as, oh, okay. So surface absorption kind of thing. Yeah. I don't know, and if, I presume that's injected IV. And so the question, a good question is, is the, are the leukocytes gobbling that up as well? I got to believe they would. But maybe if they, yeah. I wonder, do you have any idea of the size? I don't know. Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't know. That'd be good. Maybe somebody knows here. Yeah. Karen. You know, we didn't measure that. In retrospect, we should have looked at that. Um, I suspect it does. Um, in, in other, uh, again, old data from the early days of gene therapy, that when they, some of the few studies where they didn't use pegylated particles, they did notice this drop in white blood cells, and it takes a day or so for them to come back up. So I suspect that's happening in our mice as well. I just didn't, you know, we did one dose, and we didn't do repetitive dosing, but we probably see that effect in repetitive dosing. That's the next experiment, Karen. Yeah. Um, yeah, you could pegylate it or any, any nanoparticle. If you could clear these leukocytes out and that wasn't detrimental to the patient somehow, then you could come up with this follow-up injection and the patient would have reduced leukocytes. I, I'm not enough of a, well, I'm not a clinician at all. I don't know if that would be problematic. Let me ask one more question about that. The first part of the talk. Uh -huh. Yeah. Not, not only do they not chew off the FC, but they don't chew off our little peptide that we use to target the tumor either. So uh, how that works, again, uh, the title was Milk Magic. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I got to believe it's early. Because, I mean, you think of it, you've, if you've evolved this mechanism to take up antibody into the baby, presumably you're going to, even if, you know, antibodies aren't great at pH 2, right? So you, presumably you're taking it up pretty early. It doesn't it tries to minimize the exposure of the antibody to, that, to, the, to the stomach. So I don't know. 
granted, did you look at that, where, where the FC receptor is expressed in a certain part of the gut? But I, I, I got to assume it's, it's high up. It's what? It's throughout? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, you'd presume that exposure to the acid in the stomach would be minimized somehow. Yeah. So, is there anything unusual about the hexagons? They, um, you know, they're loaded with, they have, it's a membrane, right? So it's, um, you know, a biological membrane. So it's not just a liposome. It's got protein in it, including FC. Um, the lipids in exosomes tend to be raft of lipids. So they're very high in cholesterol and sphingomyelin. Um, so that may be one, you know, uh, in, in the old days when they first described rafts, they called them detergent-resistant membranes. These really rigid lipid structures don't dissolve with uh, detergents, and so they may be that they're more resistant to acid as well. But other than that, I don't know. I mean, they're, they're loaded with protein, where they're about half protein, maybe. Typical lipid membrane, typical biological membranes, half protein, half lipid, so I guess it's somewhere on that order. Um, and then there's RNAs inside. Um, but they're pretty small. You can't pack a whole lot of RNA in there. So it's mostly lipid and protein. And, and how those survive, I mean, Steve asked a great question, how those survive the gut, I don't know. But clearly, moms have evolved this mechanism. Um, so... Let's uh, let's capitalize on it. Yeah. Lymph. Yeah. We haven't looked at that, but you know, keep in mind, almost well. All liposome-based drugs, uh, well, none of them are administered orally that I know of. They're all administered IV. So um, they would have to get, presumably, in a tissue and then a draining lymph node from the tissue. But we haven't looked at that at all. But I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, there are, I have been published studies with other nanoparticles, and they do see them. They see them in the tissue, and then they see them drain in the lymph node. So I think over time, they follow that same process. And the, the beauty of a ligand is not that it, you know... The, the notion is that these ligands somehow direct these particles to a specific location, and that's just not physically possible if, if you think about it. But the, the, the function of a ligand is once it gets there, it binds to something and stays there. So it presumably doesn't get into the lymph node. So depending on what you're trying to do, a ligand may be good or bad. Well, thank you. I hope that was interesting.